Here's a look at some of the most disgraceful MasterChef dishes ever. And this one right here is the absolute worst. There's too much going in there. It doesn't work. In season two, episode five, Cody totally aced the mystery box challenge. It's flawless. If you continue to cook this way, you will win this. This pizza was a work of art, and right from the start, it looked like it was destined to win. You could tell right from the start how the show pitted for him to win. Your pizza has rich, bold, earthy flavors to it. Yeah, it's the typical story, right? Contestant boasts, crushes the challenge, feels on top of the world, and then, well, simply goes overboard. But let's come back to elimination territory. As Cody was soaking up his win, hanging with last season's champ Eric Chong, and choosing the ingredient for the next challenge, you could feel a change in the air. I'm so freaking jealous that they get to cook with these ingredients. It was like he'd been hit with a dose of overconfidence. Right in front of him were these insane ingredients, the kind that could make any chef's heart race and palm sweat. Cody, which one are you gonna choose? Lobster, Eric's pick for the big finale last season, duck, part of his own audition dish, and his beloved black truffle, the ultimate ingredient that's both rich and a real challenge to work with. It wasn't hard to see that Cody was eyeing that truffle. It was clear he was thinking about cooking instead of taking the safe route with immunity. Truffles, a little goes a long way, and for best effect, they should be used sparingly. Maybe it was Lina's influence. After seeing Line play it safe last week, Cody might have felt the need to prove. I mean, he's in the big leagues too, right? Cody will be cooking today, and that's not because he has to. Seriously, Cody was grinning like a kid in a candy store. And when he got back to his station, the best reaction came from Michael. Why would you take an advantage and throw it on the ground, spit on it, and then kick it out the door? Now, this guy from Toronto has surely dealt with overconfidence before. When he saw what Cody was up to, he immediately knew it was risky business. Talk about drama, huh? Anyway, let's cut to the moment. So, when the truffles made their grand entrance, you could see the surprise on some faces while others looked genuinely terrified at the thought of working with such a delicate ingredient. It was like watching a room full of people playing a high-stakes game of culinary hot potato. But guess what Cody decided to whip up? Pan-roasted strip loin with a beet and truffle tartare, which is a crazy idea. And in the midst of this, Kristen was sprinting around the kitchen, frantically searching for a protein to save her dish. Do you guys have any extra protein? Do you have any extra protein? She'd left her steak behind in the chaos earlier, and it was now looking like a potential disaster. And I can't weasel my way in with my basket. It's a nightmare. But then, like a knight in shining armor, Big John decided to step in. Oh, what am I doing? Here, here, here. A sirloin. Oh my god, oh my god. He had an extra piece of sirloin that he didn't need and offered it to Kristen, saving her dish from certain doom. Talk about a classy move. You could instantly see the relief on her face. But Cody, who was supposed to be chilling on the balcony, safe and sound, went a step ahead and decided to bring more drama to the table. Butter has got a little bit of thyme, white truffle oil. It's synthetic. It's one of those times that had me screaming, what are you doing? At the screen. And then there was Michael pulling his negative space move yet again, comparing his dish to this. It's like a piece of art. I put this on my wall. It's like he had one trick and he was milking it for all it's worth. And Kevin, our resident abstract artist, was in his own trip. Six, five, four, three. Yeah, it was scream worthy stuff, let me tell you. Anyway, when it was time for the judging, Kristen, who had been in a bit of a pickle earlier without her protein, had finally managed to put her dish together but it wasn't without its own set of issues. A bruschetta with a steak, potato, it, it just, just doesn't come together. She'd gone a bit heavy on the truffle oil and her steak was just okay, nothing to write home about. The plating was lackluster and her decision to add bruschetta to the mix seemed out of place. I mean, it was like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, but you know what? Bonacini wasn't afraid to share his thoughts. Master chef quality, and that's not like you. Yes, yeah, chef. Look, I hope you have better luck next time. It was a tough pill to swallow, and the look on Kristen's face said it all. But then came Cody's dish, and it was, well, a spectacle. Butter-basted New York strip loin, served over top of a truffle-infused sabayon. He'd thrown together a plate that was an overwhelming mess of big words and concepts that didn't quite hit the mark. Simply said, it was overcomplicated, with no clear direction. You couldn't even tell if there were truffles in there, and the flavor combinations were completely off. Damn sure the judges weren't impressed and Bonacini summed it up perfectly. Looking at your dish, it's a bit of a train wreck. 
However, after tasting Cody's dish, this is what Bonacini had to say. And that's not all. He then got three different kinds of truffles, and it was like a war of flavors that wasn't going anywhere. Leong was equally critical. Compare this to a bad date. Oof. It's ridiculously dressed, not very sexy. Ouch! That's gotta hurt. As for Michael, his minimalist piece of art was a bold move that didn't quite land. I don't know what to say. What is this? His rack of lamb served with a side of mashed potatoes and a few limp vegetables left a lot to be desired. The lack of sauce and the use of garlic powder in the mash was surprising to say the least. The dish seemed more like a minimalist nightmare than a masterpiece. Have you ever been to a, an art gallery and looked at a piece of art and said, what the Helsinki was he thinking when he painted that? Oh no! It was clear that Michael's gamble hadn't paid off and the dish was met with confusion rather than applause. Three pieces of vegetable, one for each of us. Finally, Kevin's dish, which he called decadent eggs with truffle, asparagus, and carrot puree, was up for review. Decadent eggs with truffle, carrot puree, asparagus. It looked impressive, almost perfect in its presentation, but the judges struggled to find something nice to say about it. I'm struggling to say something good about this dish. It seemed the taste didn't quite match the aesthetics. It was a lesson in how looks can be deceiving, especially in the kitchen. So finally, it was result time and Sabrina and David totally stole the show with their incredible dishes last night. Now, David's Agnolotti was off the charts, seriously the best thing we've seen in this whole competition. Well, looks alone, it certainly is a restaurant quality dish. They were now leading the pack for the next team challenge and you can bet they were feeling pretty pumped about it. On the flip side, it was a rough night for Cody, Michael and Kevin. They ended up with the not so coveted title of worst dishes. At least one of you, that dish will be the last dish you ever cooked. Michael, well, he'd been struggling all season, and it was sort of the same old story. And Cody, who was on a major high, kind of let his confidence get the best of him and crashed hard. You served up two of the worst dishes that we've tasted in this competition so far. And Kevin, oh man, one too many missteps, like that Philo rapper mishap, and it was just not his night for finesse. Sadly, in the end, Kevin had to pack his knives and go. Thank you, chefs. It's been a... It's been an honor. I mean, the dude had such a big heart, it was a bummer to see him go. But here's the real kicker. Cody was the one who really took the L, and he did it to himself. But, well, at least he had another chance at redemption. I'm blessed enough to still have my place here at MasterChef Canada. But only time would tell if he could bounce back from this disaster. Now let's talk about Season 7, where a contestant did something unbelievable. Look, 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 look what she's doing right now. She's cutting into the parchment paper. It was episode 6, and the elimination round was underway. However, this time, the chefs were presented with a fun twist. They had to pick two things, a cooking technique and an ingredient. But as always, there was a catch. Each of you must choose two words from this assortment of techniques and ingredients. Yeah, the contestants had to make a dish that really showed off both of those choices. It was like when you choose your favorite toppings for a pizza and have to make sure they all taste great together. Who goes first? Marissa. My game plan is to outlast everyone. Now, this is where things got a bit spicy. Marissa and Mai both did pretty well in the last challenge, but guess what? Andrew was the one who got to decide who picks first. Kind of surprising, right? Both of your choices must feature prominently in the dish you create. And well, with Andrew naming Marissa as his first choice, Mai was left feeling the pressure. Anyway, Marissa got creative and picked tamarind as her ingredient. You know, that sweet and sour fruit that adds a kick to dishes. And for her technique, she was going with on papillote, a fancy way of cooking stuff in parchment paper. It's somewhat like wrapping a present, but for food. Now, Michael informed everyone they had just one hour to cook. The judges would then check if the dishes taste good and look good. Tamarind is like an intense, sour fruit. It's kind of a treat where I come from. No pressure, right? But Marissa already had a plan. She was going all in with a seafood dish. Tuna glazed with tamarind and cooked on papillote, plus a tamarind coconut curry. I mean, it sounded like a feast for the senses. But uh-oh, Marissa made a serious blunder. Things in parchment. It's a beautiful little package, this beautiful aroma. She cut the parchment paper too early, and the judges weren't happy. Look, 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 look what she's doing right now. Alvin joked that it was like Marissa ruined his Christmas present by peeking early. Yes, I see all that aroma, that flavor leaking out of that bag. Coming back to Marissa. 
As she walked up to the judges, you could see she was wondering if opening her on Papilote early was a smart move. That I'm worried about is that choice to not present it in the parchment paper. She wanted her plate to look perfect, and it did look great. But Alvin seemed to have his mind made up before she could even explain her dish. How do they serve it? Uh, usually it's brought out at table side. Server opens the, the parchment paper for you. But guess what? She then went on to give some weird excuses. I'm not here for trickery or any uh, bells and whistles. Alvin did say it was a nice dish, just maybe not spectacular enough for this high-stakes season of Back to Win. And it's all like Christmas. I always like to see that parchment paper cut open. The judges then talked it over, and they decided that the top dishes were made by Christopher and Mai. Amazing. And the shrimp are so beautiful and sweet. Yeah, those two really brought their A-game. But this is where things get surprising. Out of the five chefs still in the game, Marissa was the only one asked to step forward. When the judges asked her about opening her dish early, she kept it real. She said she wasn't into tricks or fancy show-offs, she was all about the food. Now, Claudio told her they respect that honesty, but they also told her that her dish was the one that didn't quite hit the mark tonight. And we thought we should pay you the same respect by calling you up here to tell you that it's sadly time for us to say goodbye. It was a hard pill to swallow, but Marissa's journey in the competition came to an end. She gave it her all, but it simply wasn't enough. See, in these super competitive situations, it's the little details that make the difference. But hey, here's to Marissa for her courage and for putting her heart into every dish. Up next, in the 8th episode of Season 7, the Back to Win Kitchen was abuzz with activity for the next Tag Team Challenge. Tonight's seafood extravaganza platter will be a classic MasterChef Canada Tag Team Challenge. Taking the lead were Andy, Thea, and Christopher. And well, their teammates were quick to jump in, offering guidance and assistance from the sidelines. It's about slicing and dicing all your vegetables, spiralizing your potatoes for the garnish of the mussels. You could say that it was a team effort, but with a competitive edge. Andy took the lead initially, his movements quick and efficient. Preparation like no other. Okay, three done. Three done, yeah. move on to veg. However, his haste led to a couple of mishaps, two cuts in quick succession, and these setbacks slowed him down, allowing his East Coast teammates to lag a bit. Medic, can I get a glove? Andy yeah. just cut himself. The intensity in the kitchen ratcheted up a notch, and the chefs were acutely aware of just how much was left to be accomplished as the clock ticked down. With a mere five minutes remaining, the picture was far from complete. Only a few of the final products were beginning to take shape, and the pressure was mounting. It was a race against time, and the chefs were pushing themselves to the limit. I feel like I'm in a battle. I am getting beat up. As it turns out, the final switch happened much later in the challenge than expected. With just 60 seconds left, the teams were thrown together to plate and present their creations. It was a frenzied, somewhat chaotic scene, but the true spirit of teamwork shined through. I am desperately trying to get these Coquille Saint-Jacques done as quickly as possible. Despite the rushed and, at times, less than graceful plating process, all three teams managed to finish on the dot, their dishes ready for the judges' scrutiny. In this whirlwind of a challenge, the chefs had shown resilience, speed, and most importantly, the ability to work together under pressure. Whether they succeeded in impressing the judges was uncertain at this time. But one thing is clear, they had given it their all, and that's what counts in the end. Now, let's talk about Andrew and Andy's seafood spread and whose dish missed the mark. So, they were the first to step up to the plate and show the judges what they were made of. Overall, I think you're on the right path. There was a few missteps. At a quick glance, their creation looked a lot like the demo platter, but something seemed a bit off. Presentation looks a little rough. There is no aioli mm -hmm. in the bowl. It was like maybe a couple of ingredients got lost on the way to the table or something. Claudio gave it to them straight. He said they were heading in the right direction, but a few little hiccups led to a presentation that wasn't as polished as it could have been. And then, when they tried the ceviche, Claudio pointed out that the flaws of fish. It's a little bit liquidy. I wish it had a little more time to develop. It does need some more salt. Yeah, it was more like sushi than ceviche, perhaps, and it needed a touch more seasoning. Also, there was a bit too much liquid in there, which can make the dish feel a bit watery. But hey, those mussels? Those were a hit. I mean, he was all smiles when he tasted them. The broth is really beautiful. It's a great effort. Thank you, Chef. Well done. Next, Michael, the flavor guru, went straight for the sardine. And guess what? It was cooked just right, bursting with flavor. Yeah. Even though their coquilles Saint-Jacques weren't as visually stunning as they could have been, the taste was there. Michael was pleased with how it all turned out. 
However, Alvin had a couple of gripes. I'm not seeing a lot of moisture. You can see? Yeah. The frito misto wasn't as crispy as it should have been, and there wasn't enough sauce to tie everything together. But the squid? That was a standout star. It was cooked perfectly, and Alvin gave them major props for that. I think you can show your face in uh, <laughs> artifacts. But will it be enough in this kitchen? So, all in all, it sounds like Andrew and Andy had a mix of hits and misses, but they did have some shining moments that the judges couldn't ignore. Up next is Ryan Reynolds 2.0. Visually, his dish looked heavy-handed. Pretty tough, though. Yeah. How big is a lobster in here? Maybe quite the chunk of lobster in there, chef. And turns out that his initial plan of keeping those big chunks of lobster didn't quite sit right with the judges. They're going a tiny little flan. That's not very elegant, is it? Looks like someone misunderstood the whole deal. But was it redeeming taste-wise? You definitely achieved a creamy texture. That's only half the battle. Well, not with that much cream it wasn't. I mean, can you believe it? He fought his way back in only to produce this dumpster fire. Anyway, up next was Michael, and he was definitely praying for a miracle. Uh, I want to apologize to you for disrespecting your signature dish. Visually, it was 0 out of 5. But the seasoning and consistency turned out to be good. However, it did have its flaws. You may have gone wrong is maybe adding a little bit too much cream, and there just wasn't enough protein. To Despite the many flaws, Judge Michael was extremely considerate and gentle with this review. It's an easy mistake to make, one that I've made many times. Now that you've seen the bottom three of the night, who do you think was eliminated? While Michael had the worst looking dish, the flavor of his mousse ended up being the lifeline he needed? But what happened in this episode of MasterChef Canada is even worse. So the stage was set for a perfect harbor cruise wedding, yeah, you know, I had to throw in a wedding challenge episode here with the blue and red teams feverishly preparing their canapes. But just as the festivities were about to kick off, disaster struck. Problem. The red team has a hair on it. Okay. Michael rushed in, bearing the bad news that, apparently, a guest had discovered a hair in one of the, the canapes. One of the guests found a hair. And guess what the worst part was? It was found by the bride herself. It was the bride. Oh my the god. Despite the red team's efficiency in getting their treats out quickly, it became clear that speed wasn't everything. Quality was the name of the game here if they wanted to dig themselves out of this mess. They're winning for speed, but they're losing for quality. Below deck, the wedding guests settled in, oblivious to the drama unfolding above. After all, they were waiting for their fig appetizers to show up so they were a little busy. Somebody please grate the cucumber! Well, that was a pretty short and sweet one. And sometimes, it's the little things that are the most embarrassing. Just like this time, when one contestant served up an awful looking dish. And just when the judges were about to trash it, something crazy happened. So, in this episode of MasterChef Canada, the contestants were given the challenge to mix up cuisines and experiment with different flavors. I sure am! I've got a feeling about you that you might pull this out. So, there was this one contestant who decided to tackle the challenge with something kinda wacky. A pina colada semifreddo. Now, let me tell you, this dessert looked pretty funny, not gonna lie. But hey, as you know, looks can be deceiving in the kitchen. Sometimes, the ugliest dishes turn out to be the best. Well, at least taste-wise. This is not good enough. I'm just, I'm full of regrets. April was totally on edge when she handed her dish over to the judges. One of them, picking up on her nervous vibe, straight up asked if she whipped it up at the last minute. I had to come up with another plan and think really quick and think like a chef. And you know what? She kept it real, owing to the fact that she had to switch things up last minute and whip up something totally different. Judge Claudio respected her honesty and got ready to dig into her new creation. Let's give this a taste. As he slid a spoonful of that semi-freddo into his mouth, it was like time froze. The room went dead silent, every eye glued to him. He took his sweet time, savoring every bite, trying to unravel the mystery of those flavors. And let me tell you, those few seconds felt like forever. To everyone's shock, he was completely into the dessert. Even though it looked kinda weird, the flavors were all on point, and he dug the whole pina colada vibe of the semi-freddo, you know what, April? It tastes like a really great tropical ice cream. He was so impressed, he lauded April for bringing some bold flavors and getting creative with mixing stuff up to make this killer dessert. The way the coconut, pineapple, and rum all came together was straight up fire, making it a total win for that pina colada vibe. Great big punchy flavors. The rum, the coconut, the pineapple, that's all coming through. However, that wasn't all. While he enjoyed the flavors, he pointed out that the presentation was a significant issue. The dish's appearance was not appetizing and looked like a whack. Yeah, in no way or form was it appealing to anyone. 
The only problem is, is that you can't serve a dish like this the way it looks. And well, he had some more critique to give. They may have dishes that look nicer than yours, but the taste may not be there. In the end, he encouraged her to work on her presentation skills, suggesting that with a better visual appeal, her dish could have been a standout. He also explained that in a professional setting, no matter how delicious a dish is, it needs to look good to entice customers and make them want to eat it. April listened carefully, taking in both the praise and the critique. She was relieved that her dessert was well-received in terms of flavor, but she also understood the importance of improving her presentation. She thanked the judges for the feedback, determined to do better next time. My savory dish is a rum marinated pork taco with a tropical salsa. Well, this episode highlighted the importance of both taste and presentation in cooking. While the contestant's pina colada semifreddo was a hit in terms of flavor, its poor presentation served as a reminder that a dish needs to be visually appealing to be fully appreciated. The judge's feedback was valuable, providing her with insights on how to balance both aspects in her future creations. My pastry cream is almost completely frozen. Overall, this episode showcased the creativity and resilience of the contestants, who often have to think on their feet and come up with last-minute solutions. It also demonstrated the supportive yet critical role of the judges in helping contestants grow and improve their skills. I've got a feeling about you that you might pull this out. You know what, I gotta. I just never give up, and I've made a mistake. April's journey in this episode was a learning experience, showing that even when things don't go as planned, honesty, creativity, and the willingness to learn from feedback can lead to success. And in the end, despite the initial nerves and the less than ideal presentation, the contestant's ability to create a delicious dessert under pressure was commendable. She left the judges' table with valuable lessons and a renewed determination to refine her skills, particularly in making her dishes look as good as they taste. This episode was a testament to the challenges and rewards of culinary innovation and the ongoing journey of mastering the art of cooking. So, do you know another contestant who served the most disgraceful MasterChef dishes? Let me know in the comments below. I want to make sure everyone I've talked about and more are remembered. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. Plus, before you check out, make sure to check my next video out right here, it's even crazier!